Well, good morning, and we are in the midst of a series we've been going through for the past few weeks, examining the core beliefs of what we believe as Christians. Last week, Eddie shared with us the work of Christ, and we looked at scriptures that explain to us how God met our need for a Savior in Jesus Christ, how that Christ came, that he lived a perfect life, and then he died upon the cross for your sins and for my sins, and that by receiving him, we can have peace with God and a relationship with him. We're going to continue this week with another one of the doctrines that is true to Christianity, and it's the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. When we think about the Holy Spirit, there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of controversies. We're not going to deal with all the controversies today. We're going to deal with what Jesus taught us about the Holy Spirit. So I want us to begin by reading our doctrinal statement regarding the Holy Spirit, and let's read it together. We believe that the Holy Spirit, in all that He does, glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He convicts the world of its guilt. He regenerates sinners, and in Him they are baptized into union with Christ and adopted as heirs in the family of God. He also indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. Well, this is Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, and next week we are going to gather together our entire congregation for one service, that special time each year when we all get to see everyone else. But Palm Sunday marks the beginning of Jesus' last week with his disciples. Several times during this time, he told them that he was going away. He kept trying to get them to understand that he was not going to be with them any longer. But none of them seemed to grasp the idea that he might be dying. All of the disciples had the idea that Jesus was going to be setting up up a kingdom. That as the Messiah, he would be establishing his kingdom probably in just a few days. And through those colored glasses that they were looking at the words of Jesus, there was absolutely no way they could imagine that he was going to be crucified. As Jesus talked with them during this last week, he had some very personal discussions with them. And one of the most personal discussions was regarding how they were going to get along without him being with them. Jesus wanted them to understand that even though he was not going to be present, that they would be taken care of, that they would not be alone. And what I'd like for us to do today is look at three aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because we're going to see that's who Jesus was talking about. And the first aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that Jesus wanted us to know was that the Holy Spirit is our helper. Jesus wanted his disciples to be aware that even though he was not going to be with them, that they would not be like orphans. They would not be abandoned. That 
in his absence, we would not be alone. Jesus' words in John 14, they're going to be up here on the screen. Share with us what Jesus communicated to his disciples and in a very real sense to us also. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Jesus understands our need for help. He understands that we are weak, that we get discouraged easily, that we can lose our focus and drift off away from what he wants us to do and to be. And Jesus was preparing to send the disciples. And in going through history, it includes us also, on the greatest mission the world has ever seen. And that is to take the message of Christ into all all the world and gather people together under the name of Jesus, living for him, and identified with him. He knew that without him being present that we would need supernatural help. And so he says, I'm going to send you another helper. There's two words for another in the Greek. And Jesus had the choice of choosing either one of these words, but each word would have communicated something different. The word heteros means another of a different kind. And the word alios means another of the same kind. Now let me explain the difference. As some of you know, I drive a 1994 Toyota pickup. It's blue. It has a bunch of bumps and scrapes on it, and it has 250,000 miles on it. The thing just won't die. It just keeps going. Well, if I were to tell you that I bought a new truck, and I used the word heteros, to say that I had bought another truck, you would know that I bought a pickup. You wouldn't have any idea of what color it was. You wouldn't know if it was a Toyota like I had or if it was a Ford. You wouldn't know how many miles it had on it. You wouldn't know whether it was used or whether I just drove it off the lot. All you would know is I bought a pickup truck. However, if I use this other word for another, alios, and it's the word that Jesus uses here when he says, I'm going to send you another comforter. If I used that word, alios, the word Jesus used, and I said, you know, I bought another pickup you would know that it was a blue Toyota, that it was a 1994, that it wasn't in real great shape and it had a whole bunch of miles on it. Because the idea of the word alios 
means it's another of the same kind. And now grasp what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He says, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you without someone to help you. In fact, I'm sending you another comforter who's just like me. Now, sometimes we say, oh, if we just had Jesus today, if I just had Jesus right here near me, I would do everything right. Now, in our world today, could you imagine trying to get an appointment with Jesus if he were alive today? You think the Pope's busy, I'm sorry. You could not ever get close to Jesus. But what Jesus did is he gave us his presence in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ministers to us just like Jesus would. I don't know about you, but that's exciting to me. I'm not left alone. When I go through a difficult time in life, I can look to the presence of my Lord. I can look to my God. I can know that the one who is within me comforts me just as Jesus would. When I open God's word to study it, I have understanding, not because I'm so smart, but because the Holy Spirit teaches me. When I face temptation, there's that small, still voice within me saying, don't go there. Get away from sin. When I do blow it, there's also that voice saying, come back to me. And there's a peace there when I come back into his presence. Jesus said, I'm giving you another comforter. And I want you to recognize four things real quick about it. And the first one is that the Holy Spirit, he is God. Know that. He is God. He is the third person of the Trinity. He is not an it. Nor is he, like some of the older translations of the Bible translated the word spirit, he's not a ghost. He is the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. Also, he is not Jesus in a different form. Understand that. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus. He is a unique member of the Godhead who leads us to focus on Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. All unique, yet one. He is also very personal. He can be lied to. We can insult him. We can resist him. And your actions and my actions, we grieve him. He knows where we're going at times and where we're headed, and it breaks his heart because he knows it's not for our best. And then he lives within the believer. And he is always with the believer. Those are four powerful truths about our helper. But there's also another aspect of the Holy Spirit Jesus wanted us to know. And that is that our life in Christ is made real by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not shine a light on himself. He doesn't call attention to himself. But rather he seeks to make the life of Christ real for you and for me. 
In John 16, I want us to read the passage. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You imagine Jesus talking to the disciples and he knows everything that's coming. And the, and the disciples think they have it all figured out. Wow, he's about to become king. Everything's going to be great from now on. And Jesus says, I got a lot more things to say to you, but you're not ready to hear it. But then he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will be with us. And that he will be personal to us. And in a real sense, the Holy Spirit is able to do something that Jesus really would have been unable to do. If you read the stories of the life of Christ in in any of the four gospel accounts, you see there are times when people wanted to be with Jesus. Where either they were lined up or they were saying, where is he? We want to spend time with him. And Jesus had to tell the disciples, we can't do that right now. We have to go somewhere else. Because see, the mission of Jesus was the cross. (laughs) And his goal was to gather around him a core group of people who could carry the message after his death. But Jesus' focus was headed to Jerusalem to die on the cross. He wasn't able to be with all the people. And today, he would not be able to be with each of us. There's too many believers worldwide, and they would not be able to be with him. But in the Holy Spirit, we have his presence. When we think about what Jesus says here, he talks about the Spirit being the Spirit of truth. It's the Holy Spirit that gives power to God's Word. When we read the Word of God and and it opens up before us, the Spirit illuminates. He shines a light on the truths of God. And touches our heart with the meaning of those truths and makes them real. I'm amazed how, after reading the Bible for 40 plus years, I can still sit down with it and read something I've read a hundred different times, and it's like something new pops out at me. Something that has been there the whole time, but I I never really saw it that way before. And what that is, is the Holy Spirit taking the unique circumstances of my life at this time and taking that truth and blending it together to show me something new about God that up to this point just hadn't clicked yet. And the Spirit is so good to do that. Before we sit down to read God's Word, it should always be a practice of us that we pause before God and say, Father in heaven, have your Spirit open your Word to me as I read it today. But the Holy Spirit also moves in our hearts that we might grasp the reality 
of the grace that is in Christ Jesus. When Jesus was talking with Nicodemus, a very knowledgeable religious leader at that day, he talked to him about the need to be born of the Spirit. For you see, the Holy Spirit is the one who creates the new life within us when we turn in faith to Jesus Christ. And not only does He create the life within us, but He continues encouraging its growth by working out in our lives what we oftentimes call the fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you talk about the fruit of a tree, we're talking about the natural produce that comes off a particular tree. But when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about what the Holy Spirit produces within our lives. And in Galatians chapter 6, verses 22 and 23, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, that's what the Holy Spirit is working to produce in our lives. We don't produce it. He produces it, and we enjoy it. Not only is he working to produce fruit in our lives, but he's even helping us pray. Have you ever had a burden on your heart that you came before God with and you just, you just didn't know quite what to say? Either it was one of those situations where you didn't know what God's will was. Or it was a situation where, like I've found myself many times, knowing what I wanted, but not knowing what God wants for me. And just being honest to say, Lord, my emotions are all messed up here in this thing. What do you want? But we're told that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. What that says to me is that things that we are just talking verbally and casually about, the Holy Spirit takes it and and recognizes the importance behind it. And with groanings that's just too deep for words, he comes and takes our prayers before the throne of God in heaven. And it's the Spirit who assures us of our salvation. You know, one of the great promises of life in Christ is that of eternal life. And I meet so many of children, children of God, individuals who have a personal relationship with Christ, who Satan has caused to doubt what God has done for them. One of the great blessings of the work of the Spirit is that it is given as the down payment on our salvation. In fact, Paul calls the work of the Spirit the earnest of our salvation, that down payment that God gives us of eternal life. And we're told that the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And another place, by this we know that we abide in Him and He in us. Not because we are good, not because we've done great things or we've avoided sins or we've done all these, these wonderful works, but we know that he abides in us because he has given us 
his spirit. Period. You see, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Scripture is plain. And the Holy Spirit is God's presence within us as the assurance that our salvation that comes from trusting in Christ is secure and solid. And then the next thing he does, he brings us together in his church. He actually places us within the body of Christ. And he makes you and me family. He makes us part of an eternal family. And he brings us together and each one of us, he gives us the ability to be able to serve each other. Because we're family. You know, when a family gathers together at a, at a holiday, we all know the one who can make the best pumpkin pies. We know the ones that we don't want to make the pumpkin pies. <laughs> we know who's going to do the turkey or make the tamales or make the cakes or make up the iced tea. We know who does it the best. And as a family, when we gather together, we kind of know Who's going to do what? My sister always brought the sweet potatoes. Even to this day, I hunger for those sweet potatoes. Just like that in a family here, each one of us comes together. And we each contribute to that great feast that is the church. That time as we're together worshiping, and, and you'll see it next week, especially when we all gather in one place, and people are serving, how we all come together, and God is glorified. Paul said, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. God's building us together. And that's the work of His Spirit. You're not here by accident. You're here because the Spirit brought you here. And then there's a third aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that Jesus wanted us to know about. And that is that the truth of the gospel is revealed by the Holy Spirit. It is a blessing the way the Holy Spirit ministers to you and me. It really is. But do you know he also ministers to those who have not yet believed in Christ? Because of sin, our hearts are darkened. Sin separates us from God so that we want nothing to do with God. Before I trusted Christ, we had this pastor in our community. We lived in a kind of a rural area. Of, if it's hard to imagine a rural area of Southern California. It kind of contradictory. But this guy was sort of the community pastor. And he would drop by the house. And he'd knock on the door. And if I saw him coming in the front door, I'd head out the back. I didn't want to have anything to do with the guy. And then there were all these kids in church, these churchy kids, always doing all this goody good stuff. We made fun of them. Some of my friends threw rocks at them. <laughs> Terrible. I wanted nothing to do with spiritual things. And then one day, a buddy of mine talked me into going to church with him. All right, I'll go. I was about halfway listening. 
But something began to stir in my heart. Something unexplainable. Something which was saying, wake up and listen. And it was the work of the Holy Spirit drawing me to himself. Let's read in John 16 what is said. Jesus says, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, that was probably some big question marks right there. What do you mean go away? Our advantage? But he says, if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. You see, the Holy Spirit comes beside us in our unbelief. He comes beside us and he confirms the truth of the message of the gospel we're hearing. Without the convicting work of the Spirit... We would go on, go on in a sin-darkened existence, never aware of the depth of our sinfulness and separation from God. But I'm so thankful that in a real sense, God took the first step. That when that friend of mine who simply obeyed the Bible and said, bring your friend to church. And he got me there after asking me quite a few times. Then the Spirit grabbed hold of me and began working with me. I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. All I knew is that what I heard about Jesus Christ that he had died on the cross for me and that my sins separated me from him but that in his death because he died for me I could be forgiven if I would turn to him in faith it was like God said this is true Listen to this. This is your need. And it was a stirring within my heart that nobody else could see. But God drew me to himself based on the love of Christ. God confirmed the truth. And that's what the Holy Spirit does to us before we come to him. Now, I want to take the next few minutes and talk, talk real practically about the Holy Spirit. How real is the Holy Spirit to you? I have to be honest with you that for a number of years in my Christian life, I ignored the ministry of the Holy Spirit because I didn't want to be identified with people who had gone so overboard. I kind of wanted to be conservative and cautious. But what I realized is that the Holy Spirit wanted to have a relationship with me. 
He wanted to guide me. He wanted to control my life. He wanted me to willingly give my life to being led by him. And when we come to those tough times of life, when we wonder how do we get through it, we get through it because of the comfort of the Spirit. When we come to God's Word and we want to know what God is teaching us, it's by the Spirit of God that that truth comes alive off the page. When I want to be more like Jesus, it's not about being more religious. It's not about going to church. But it's about letting the Spirit of God develop in my life those characteristics that only He can do. And then when it comes to talking to my friends and my family, when I want to share with them the truth about Christ that can save their souls, I recognize that all I do is introduce the subject and the Spirit does the work. The Holy Spirit is real. He's our helper. He's the greatest blessing that Jesus ever gave us. But I'd also like to talk to you today if you don't know Christ. This might be your first time here at Grace. You might have been coming for a while and you kind of picked up on the idea that Jesus died on the cross for a specific reason, that he died for you, and that in his death, he paid the sin debt that we owe to God. Every one of us in this building today are sinners. The difference isn't, are you a sinner or are you not? We're all sinners. But the difference is, are you a forgiven sinner or an unforgiven sinner. That's the only difference. And Christ died on the cross so that we could become forgiven sinners. And what the Spirit does is He touches our hearts and He says, that's true. He touches our hearts and He says, listen to that. And there is a drawing that he does on our lives as he draws us to God who for so long we sought to run from. And rather than running from God, we find ourselves after we turn to God to become worshipers of God. This morning, if you're a child of God, Recognize the Spirit is ministering to you. We're told to get in step with the Spirit, <laughs> to walk in step with Him. And we do that by daily yielding ourselves to the leadership of the Spirit. And if you've never trusted Christ before, if you've heard a lot of the talk about Jesus dying on the cross and about you need to place your faith in him, all that means is just saying, Lord Jesus, you died for me. You took my place. Forgive me of my sins. I'm turning to you. That's what it's all about. I invite you today as we, as we pray for you to pray that simple prayer. Just turning yourself from trusting and believing in yourself to trusting and believing in Jesus.